Hello and welcome to Screencast 5. In the last screencast, we were beginning to understand that inductive effects could give us our first insight into where the electrons were in molecules and how that began to influence reactivity. And we're going to say a bit more about reactivity in this screencast, because having a feel for the reactivity and character of a molecule is essential. And we achieve this by understanding how electrons are distributed. Electrons are the most mobile, accessible part of a molecule, and therefore it's electrons that control how molecules want to react. Let's sort of define what reactivity really is in terms of organic chemistry. Reactivity is the movement of electron density in order to break weak bonds and form new stronger bonds. This is based on controllable and predictable electronic effects. So, reactivity is the movement of electron density in order to break weak bonds and form new stronger bonds. And this is based on controllable and predictable electronic effects. And as you'll know, we show the movement of electrons using curly arrows. And a curly arrow moves two electrons. We move pairs of electrons. <clears throat> so, we're going to think first of all about heterolytic bond cleavage. And let's look at this molecule here, a carbon with a bond to a chlorine. The way we can think of a heterolytic bond cleavage, the chlorine is delta minus, it wants electron density, and therefore we can break the bond and give those two electrons to the chlorine. Now, on that chlorine to start with, we had one, two, three lone pairs of electrons. And it was getting its seventh and eighth electrons in the bond to the carbon. So what happens when we cleave that bond? Well, we're left with a carbon with three bonds attached and it has an empty orbital, which we depict as a positive charge. It has six electrons at the carbon. One, two in this bond, three, four in this bond, five, six in that bond. And so that carbocation has an empty orbital. And the chlorine it has its three lone pairs, and then we show it with a negative charge. And I want you to note that that negative charge, it represents a lone pair with a negative charge. It represents two electrons in our view as organic chemists. Typically at school, you'll have spent a lot of time drawing all of the lone pairs. We're essentially going to drop that from now on and not draw all the lone pairs on everything. We're only going to draw lone pairs if we use them in the mechanism. But it is a useful way of electron counting because we can see that the chloride ion has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons on it. And of course, it has the eight electrons because both electrons from the bond have moved onto the chloride. chloride. Let's think about a molecule where the heterolytic bond cleavage might flow the other way. This is a carbon bonded to a lithium. So we said lithium's electropositive. It doesn't really want electron density, so it would rather give them away. And so we can break 
the bond heterolytically and give the electrons to the carbon. In this case, we get a carbon. Again, it has three bonds attached, but this time it has an extra pair of electrons. That's what the arrow shows. The arrow moves two electrons onto the carbon, and we show that as a negative charge. So this has eight electrons, two in each bond, and two associated with that negative charge. And we describe that as a carb anion. The system up here, previously, we can refer to as a carbocation. So we have carbanions and carbocations. And what's left behind, well, what's left behind is a lithium. It's lost its share of an electron. It has an empty s orbital and a positive charge associated with that. Okay? So I'll note the lithium now has an empty s orbital. So that's what happens if you break a bond heterolytically. Hetero, it goes like to form two different types of species, a negative and a positively charged species. We can do homolytic bond cleavage as well, where the bond splits equally in each direction to give two species that are similar to each other. So we could take a carbon chlorine bond and we could do homolytic bond cleavage. If we do homolytic bond cleavage, we use what we call fish hook arrows. And this arrow means you're moving one electron. And rather than calling them curly arrows, we sometimes call them fish hook arrows. And of course, because there's two electrons in the bond between the carbon and the chlorine, one goes to the carbon and one goes to the chlorine. So what does that give us? Well, it gives us a carbon with three bonds attached and one electron that's gone on to the carbon. So this carbon in total has seven electrons, two in each bond and the seventh there. This is a radical species and it has seven electrons. And of course, we also generate a chlorine. It will have its one, two, three lone pairs. Don't really need to show them. We're just doing it for counting purposes. And that extra electron that's come out from the carbon chlorine bond. So again, it has seven electrons and it's another radical species. So homolytic bond cleavage because it generates a radical and a radical rather than a cation and an anion for heterolytic bond cleavage. These are the ways that we can break bonds in organic chemistry. 90% of the time, we do heterolytic chemistry. 10% of the time, we do radical type chemistry. So at the bottom of the page, we have a nice summary of this. Here it is, summary. And it just shows that an AB bond can either undergo heterolysis to give a cation and an anion, or homolysis to give a radical and a radical. And we refer to these things as reactive intermediates. And the reactive intermediates will somehow get converted into products. And we're not too worried about the detail of that at the moment. Now, you might be thinking, why does Dave put circles around his charges? He draws a positive charge and puts it in a circle and a negative charge and puts it in. So why is that? It's just the convention. We do it a lot as organic chemists. And mainly it's just done so that if we have a negative charge, it doesn't get confused with a bond in our drawing. We can see it. But really it's because charges are some of the most important things in mechanisms. And by putting circles around them, they jump out at us. And the whole point of skeletal drawing and the way we do everything is to make organic chemistry easy. And seeing the charge is really important. Put it in a circle. You can see it. It doesn't blend into the background of your molecule. Okay. 
So when we're doing this kind of reaction process, our reaction has an energy profile associated with it. And we should have a little look at the energy profile for a simple reaction. Any of those heterolysis or homolysis reactions above can be depicted as follows. You start off with reactants at a certain energy and you have to activate them and turn them into your reactive intermediate. It might be a carbocation. It might be a radical. So there's a barrier to reaction. That takes energy to do that. We had to break a bond apart to do that. We refer to that as the activation energy of the reaction. And then once we've got our reaction intermediate, typically quite quickly over a small energy barrier, it turns into the products. So most of our attention focuses on how do we get over this energy barrier? The first step is slow. It has the highest energy barrier, the activation energy, and it's called the rate determining step of a reaction. And in the rate determining step, we go through a transition state. And the transition state is the point of highest energy on our reaction profile. So it's really important. And for any reaction that we want to do in organic chemistry, that energy barrier is crucial. The reasons that it's crucial is that a smaller energy barrier means a faster reaction. Fast reactions are what's going to happen. They are more likely to occur. And the energy barrier will depend on the energy of the intermediate. If you have to access a certain intermediate and it's really high energy, you're going to have an incredibly high energy barrier to get to it. Whereas if you're going to access a reaction with an intermediate of a low energy, then it's quite easy for your reaction to get to that intermediate. So fundamentally, the lower, the better. And we often say stable intermediates are good. That's the shorthand that's used. We want a stable intermediate. And you'll read it and hear it all the time. I actually prefer to think of it as an energetically accessible intermediate. I think the word stable gets you in some trouble in your head because people think, oh, if the intermediate's stable, then it's never going to turn into the products. It's just stable, right? We made a stable intermediate, so it doesn't want to react. It doesn't want to make the products. That's not the way to think about it. Right? The point is, it's energetically accessible. We can make the intermediate, and then anyway, it quickly turns into the products. It's not really, really stable. It's energetically accessible. Okay? So I call that, and this is a bit of my language, the principle of energetically accessible intermediates. And as it says, in the second step, that reactive intermediate is rapidly converted into products no matter what it is. And that releases the energy and the reaction completes. It's worth noting in the box here that this is the so-called Hammond postulate, is that the transition state will be very similar to the thing it's closest in energy to. And that means for most reactions, the transition state is similar to the reactive intermediate. So if we understand all about the reactive intermediate, we understand about the transition state. So we spend a lot of time thinking about the energy level, the energetic accessibility of intermediates, reaction intermediates. And then we assume that the transition state is quite like that. So it tells us about how big the energy barrier is. And if we can predict how big the energy barrier is, 
we know how good the reaction will be. And so thinking about the stability of intermediates using simple electronic effects again is going to be the topic of our next screencast.